Welcome to Veterans in Politics. I'm sitting here with a gentleman who grew up in Toronto, Jane and Finch area, the, the gang infested area. He, for part of his life, he was a, attracted to the allure of the streets. Michael A. Amos. Thank you, Michael, for joining me. Thank you for having me today. You wrote a book. The book's sitting right just behind us, uh, yep. Both Sides of the Fences, uh, Surviving the Trap. Yes. And in the book, you talk about your experience growing up. I know that you have some relatives that uh, your, your father was a stuntman. You have an uncle that uh, won the 1988 uh, silver medal in the, the Olympics. That's correct, yeah. And also you won a, another uh, boxing belt afterwards, after 1992. Yeah, the, the NABF uh, Light Heavyweight Championship, I believe, in uh, Virginia Beach. Yeah, so that's Egerton Marcus, uh, my uncle on my father's side. That's correct. And, and your father, for a period of his life, he actually was employed by Mr. T. Yeah, so he, he was a stunt double on the TNT series here in Canada. So it was pretty interesting growing up. So I come from a divorced household, but when I was with my father, it was interesting because I, I remember a lot being on movie sets, which probably has steered me towards the acting part now <laughs> so it it did rub off but um i did boxing for a little while but uh, my mom was opposed to that so that stopped <laughs> but uh, i do have three olympians in my family my great uncle charles represented guyana in the olympics at one point in time his son charles amos ross uh is was in the i want to say 96 olympics and the 2000 olympics and my dad's younger brother egerton marcus is the 88 silver medalist uh, in the middleweight division, so. You come from a, a single parent uh, household. Your mother was the one that, that brought you and your brothers and sisters up. You talk about in the book, the struggles that you went through. There's one story I want you to share. That's that one where you were pounding on a nickel, made it into a quarter, yeah. and you're able to use it in the washing machine? Yeah, so I think the mentality that develops as a kid in an underprivileged area is, is one of survival. So the story that you're referring to, I remember our washing machine broke and you know, at the time it couldn't have been more than $150 to a $200 repair. But at the time that was a world of money, especially when you're a seven or eight year old kid um, or you know, a little bit younger or a little bit, sorry, <laughs> I was a little bit older than that. Um, but. Um, I remember finding nickels on my mother's dresser and thinking, why can't I make money stretch? Why can't I make it grow? So we had this big concrete slab in front of my house. So I sat there with the nickel and I pounded it into the size of a quarter and then we would go across the street and try to use it in the machines and they actually worked for, for a little while. And after that, you know, the, the housing authority, at the time it was MTHA, Metro Toronto Housing Authority, they put up signs, you know, Anybody who does this will you know, get in trouble and things like that. And I, I didn't really know why you would get in trouble for helping out your family. I, cu I couldn't understand the concept. And, and I think when you don't leave the area growing up, that mentality never leaves you. So some of the heinous crimes that outward society looks at these individuals doing they haven't evolved their mentality to say that or to differentiate that a this is wrong or or b this is right they still have that mentality of i'm going to do what's necessary to survive first and foremost and i'm going to do what's necessary to help and provide for my family jane and finch the way that you're describing in the, in the book there both sides of the fence is I get a sense it's almost like a war zone. I know a lot of us veterans that have served overseas at the United Nations and also the, for NATO and that, a lot of them are, are suffering from PTSD because of the memories that, you know, what they see over there and then they're coming back to Canada. But reading that book right there, I have a sense that there's an awful lot of children that grew up in the area that, you're, that you grew up in that have the PTSD. Yeah, so with respect to PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder um, for individuals. Again, I don't want to be as, as um, crass to say that it's the exact same thing as you know a veteran who served in the Gulf War or any type of war-torn situation. But there are elements of PTSD that definitely affect the residents of 
lower income areas, not only in Canada, but the US as well. When you're coming home every day and you know, you're, you're seeing friends shot or friends stabbed and friends killed, these things do take effect on your perception of the outside world. Jane and Finch happens to be a 10 by five block radius at best. So if you're not leaving that area and elements throughout the month are constantly pointing to you can be at effect to things that are going on in that area, you develop a survival mentality, you develop a mentality of negativity and, and negative things seeming like they're going to happen to you. So you take a stance of defense. And, and in some case, you take a stance of being the actual aggressor because nobody, I don't think any human being wants to feel um, like they're at affect to things or like they're going to be the victim of things. But yes, you do feel elements of post-traumatic stress disorder um, when bullets are flying by you and you're running into your house, you know, and I've experienced running into my house and, you know, having, uh, you know, almost anxiety and, and, and that sort of panic. And the, the sad thing is a lot of the residents learn to cope with it. But the worst part I think about that is there are no governing bodies, there are no systems set up in place to help the residents deal with some of these elements of PTSD. So what I mean by that is, let's say a shooting occurs in an area like Jane and Finch in Toronto or Regent Park or Jamestown in Rexdale. If the shooting happens inside of an actual school, like once upon a time there was a shooting in C.W. Jeffries where one of the youth was shot inside of a school. Now when that happens inside of an actual school, then they send people to come and talk to the children in the school, how are they feeling, they send counselors to, grief counselors to actually have a discussion with them so that they can have an emotional release. What about the residents in these areas when that happens? How come there are no systems set up in place for vans to come where people can actually go inside the vans and vent their emotions as opposed to internalizing them and then picking up a gun and then retaliating? So, you know, the, the society at large can look at these individuals like they're bad individuals and they're, um, they're monsters and they're just vengeful negative people, but we're, we're not giving them any elements to, to vent their frustrations and, and deal with some of this post-traumatic stress disin, uh, syndrome and, and some of these emotional disorders that develop as a result of seeing a lot of violence happen. In your book there, Both Sides of the Fences, you actually talk about uh, not only witnessing uh, murders at a very young age, that when most kids are outside, they're playing, uh, cops and robbers or they're playing uh, other games you're witnessing murders and you show pictures of you know your young friends that have lost their life and they still have so much more to give yeah and it's um it's it's definitely hard i definitely carry each individual who i, I i've grown up with and lost every single day i feel like when anytime i do something successful <laughs> quote unquote successful sitting in an interview, I feel like I'm, I'm trying to embody who they could have become had they had the chance to actually grow up. Especially KG. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, he, he was a kid that, you know, grew up across the street from me and played basketball. And, you know, a lot of us, we were the same people, but I, I got to leave the neighborhood and experience other elements of society as a whole and that started to change the way my outlook was on life in and itself so again going back to that one of the biggest problems is these kids don't have the opportunity to actually leave the neighborhood and experience positivity in other realms and while programs like the jane and finch boys and girls club are very positive why connect at the corner of jane and finch it's in one of the the, the buildings there um, very positive. I've had some communications with them and talked to them as well. These are programs that get kids off the streets, but A, they're underfunded, and B, they're, they're not funded to the point where kids can have actual excursions 
outside of the neighborhood, which will help shape their view of the entire world, or, or at least Toronto as a whole. Some of these kids haven't left that 10 by 5 block radius of Jane and Finch. So their mentality and their philosophy on life is shaped by a 10 by 5 block radius. And then we're asking them to go out into society and be productive, fully functioning members of society. I think that's asking a bit much when we're not doing anything to combat the problem, for lack of a better um, word. And the profits uh, off your book there, uh, they're going to be donated over to the Boys and Girls Club for Jane and Finch. Yeah, so that's correct. So um, I, I'm, I'm very excited about that. We, so far, we've raised, uh, I want to say, just over $2,000 off the proceeds of all the books. Every single book, um, the proceeds are going to the Jane and Finch Boys and Girls Club. And what I had in mind for that is, A, to donate a check, but the, the allocation of those funds is going to go towards taking these kids on an excursion outside Toronto. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to coordinate with um, the University of Western or Huron College out in London, Ontario, to try to get the kids to go to um, one of the events there, like the football game, like the homecoming game. Because there's, there's nothing quite like being a kid and, and going on to a university campus and seeing what student life is like, what Greek life is like on a campus. I know I went down to the US on scholarship and I was, I was mind blown when I got down there. I said, you know, I, I didn't even know you could live like this. You know, you get three square meals a day as a kid and coming from the trap like Jane and Finch, that's, you know, that's more than you most You struggle people. just to even have two meals a day at Jane and Finch as you're pointing and you're in your book there. Yeah, and, and sometimes, you know, you're, you know, my mom always did what she could to provide for us, but she was always working two or three jobs. You know, there were times where we had to go to the food bank to get, you know, more food and things like that. And, you know, it, it, university provides a situation where it cultivates things like creativity and things like your philosophy on life overall, and it, and it does a really good job of that. And I'm not saying that every kid is going to make it through the university or the education system as a whole, but we need to at least give them the chance and give them options to see something different than just the immediate Jane and Finch area, their respective Jane and Finch area. As you're talking about there, we have to remember during the mayor race last year that they mentioned that 24% of the youth unemployment rate here in Toronto. So and probably that's why a certain percentage of the youth has feel, felt like society has ignored them. You yourself, you're able to, to go down to the United States, get the education, come back to Canada. Uh, you're able to, to move out of the, the government housing over to London. And now you've gotten involved within the movie industry. 2004 with the, the first project you're involved with. Uh, Meg Ryan was the, yeah, the star in that. Against the Ropes. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, I, I think it, I've always been uh, more of a science kind of a guy. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I, I do have that part of my father's side of the family where I'm very athletic and, and very outgoing. I do have that, those elements. So my father first introduced me to the movies and the movie industry. And for a while, it kind of laid dormant inside me but you know as you as you make it out of situations in your life where your flame your life could have possibly been taken or extinguished you start to develop a mentality of getting over fear and fear not that it becomes non-existent you still have elements of it in you but you learn how to navigate it and go through it and what develops on the other side of that is a mentality of I can pretty much do anything. So you see individuals like um, Kanye West, who's a famous rapper, and he was in a traumatic car accident. And prior to that, he was always a really extremely talented movie producer. But it seemed like after that single event where he didn't die in that traumatic car crash, he felt like, I have these gifts and I want to give them to the world and I'm not afraid of anything because if it was my time to go, it would have been my time to go. Same with the story of 50 Cent. Uh, there's, there's so many stories of that. And I think growing up in the neighborhood I did where you face so many elements of fear, so many elements of death around, when 
it doesn't happen, you develop this mentality of, I fully understand when it's my time to go, I'm gonna go, but until then, I'm gonna give the world every piece of my gifts and leave something behind. A lot of people feel like when they die, they don't leave anything behind. And that's the entire opposite of what happens in this world, in this time and space. There was a guy named Jesus, something like 2,000 years ago, and his name, his name still carries on. There's you know, Caesar from Rome, there's Napoleon, Tupac. there's Tupac, you know, and these names, these people have left legacies where it still carries on. You know, I, I feel like doing movies and my books, these are parts of me that when I'm no longer here, somebody can borrow pieces of my brains, borrow pieces of my perspective, and perhaps do a little bit better than I did at a little bit earlier of a stage than I did. So that's what's developed in me now. So that's why I'm pretty gung-ho on, you know, getting into the movie industry and writing as a hobby as well. And, you know, I continue to want all the proceeds of Both Sides of the Fence, Surviving the Trap, my first book, and the follow-up of the 2019 release, Both Sides of the Fence, Searching for Success, which I'm working on right now, all the proceeds to go to, you know, the Jane and Finch Boys and Girls Club continually. Because I think if, if change is actually going to happen within that area, then people from that area need to step up and, and um, pioneer that actual change. Well, here in Toronto, there's such a big community when it comes to the, you know, people going into movies, people going into music. An artistic community in, in, in Toronto, in the GTA and Niagara region, we're talking all the way over to uh, Ottawa and that. It's just huge. There's so many opportunities in Ontario. Uh, can you give your website real quick? Because there's a lot more information on your website that I think people should go check out. They may have some questions. I highly suggest reading the book. I've read the book. Thank you. You know, and, and I'm telling people, go read the book because there's a lot of stuff we didn't cover. I think it's extremely important for people to, to see what it was like in that area, uh, in government housing, uh, in regards to Toronto, and what areas that we really need to improve upon because you kept pointing out, this is what's happening. This is what we need to re repair the, the situation. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I want the book to affect positive change. So that's why all the proceeds are going to the Jane and Finch Boys and Girls Club. If I had one wish for the book, it would be adopted as text for the Toronto Police Services, for the Ontario Police Services, for you know, most of the police services in Canada so that at least they could learn what the mentality of a kid coming out of these situations are and why. So my website is www.michaelaamis.com and underneath the author section, you can read a brief synopsis of the book, you can click on a picture of the book and read an excerpt from the actual chapter, but you can find out more about the book from there. Um, for the generation that's on social media, I'm on Twitter at Michael A. Amos 1, and um, the same is for my Instagram, at Michael A. Amos 1, so you can follow me there um, and, and just follow along the journey and follow along the process. Looking forward to more stuff coming from you. I know there's some projects that you're uh, involved with my movie wise they're going to be coming out next year correct i'm really looking forward to all that you know thank you michael for your thank time. you very much for your time today